and away we go. Now, who gets the cleaner start? Largely Cambridge, I think. There at the top of the picture on the uh, Surrey station, Oxford at the bottom of the picture on the Middlesex station. And certainly the early advantage would seem to be with Cambridge. This, at the moment, is a repeat of the Goldie Isis race. They got away cleanly, both crews. Very good. They're quite close together, but parallel. Coming down Fulham Reach, and it will be interesting to see whether Samantha Benham can hold the uh, Cambridge crew out so that she can turn late and force the adjustment from her opposite number, Martin Haycock. If he doesn't go quickly enough with her, then that's where so much can be decided. But it's, it's Cambridge who have the advantage, so it's going to be difficult for Sam Benham if this goes on. Cambridge have got to their stride very, very quickly, and it's the stride that's going to count. Oxford are relying on their power, but here, with Cambridge on the outside of this initial bend, they've actually moved up, and that's a very good sign for Cambridge, I think. Cambridge have got to counter the effect of the Middlesex bend, which is worth about half a length to Oxford, and they've already stolen that first half length, in fact, even perhaps a little bit more than that, and if they can hold this to the mile post, it will give them a crucial advantage coming up towards the Hammersmith Bridge bend. If you look at the puddles, if you look at the puddles, the stroke man of the, uh, of the seven men of the, of the of both crews going in behind the bow, the bow pair puddles, you'll see that Cambridge are actually covering more at the moment. They're letting their boat run better. It's already looking very well. It's got three quarters of a length to Cambridge. It's an excellent start as they come up almost to Craven Cottage, Fulham Football Ground. They must neutralise this advantage to Oxford Ground this next bit. They must try and take any heart away from Oxford, and it will then give them the courage to believe that they can drive round to Hammersmith and round that bend. So how much are Cambridge in with the position of just pushing Oxford out of the best of the stream here as they turn? I think the, the, the classic moment for the Cox on the Middlesex station usually to turn is when you see the name on the stand. They've got it. They've got that clear water. They've done it from the, uh, on the outside of the corner and they have outstripped Oxford to that first three-minute, critical three-minute corner. And that is impressive. Oxford are going to have a lot of difficulty now to pull this back. That is extraordinary. Oxford's rhythm isn't as good as Cambridge's uh, rhythm. Oxford have got to put something together now. They're in dire trouble now because Cambridge are actually pulling out to a length and a half even more. They're quite clearly settled into a, a very comfortable rhythm. Oxford are struggling. Oxford need to find their 34, the rhythm which allows them to work through other crews. But when you're this far behind, it's very difficult. I watched Cambridge against Molesy two weeks ago. Molesy had a crew of internationals, six Olympians in the boat, and they did exactly this on exactly the same two stations two weeks ago. This is a very, very impressive move by Cambridge. They've taken, they've taken their chance on the outside of that corner, and they are now in a commanding position. And you can see, looking over Ian Gardner's shoulder, Cambridge apparently disappearing. And the years of the spectre of defeat for Cambridge, it's early days yet, but this is a wonderful start for them. But I think it should be said that Oxford, because of their historical advantage of recent years, maybe will keep their nerve at this moment. It's a real test for them. We have a real race on our hands here, and we're looking at a very flowing Cambridge crew. Well, from two lengths ahead, it will be a very brave man who would, if, it, if the condition had been reversed, if Oxford were in front, no one would give Cambridge a chance here. But there's no doubt that Oxford have the commitment and the experience to row from behind, but the two lengths down is a very long way. It allows Martin Haycock of Cambridge to take exactly the line he wants, and he's going to just pull that crew away. Emphasizing there the point that Dan Topolsky was making about the puddles. Look at the stroke. He's has clear water to drop his uh, cleaver oar into. At the mile post, Cambridge 331, Oxford 336, and that equals the record at the mile post set by Oxford in 1978. This is, we are seeing some uh, historical stuff here. Oxford hoping to go level in the series uh, to, to 69 each. Cambridge trying to stop that from happening. Cambridge now on course to break the record. Cambridge a, a length and a half, to two, a two and a half lengths up now, and this is quite exceptional. Well, this is how Cambridge can see Oxford, not the Cox, of course, but all the oarsmen who are 
forming with their blades in the way that Harry Mann, their coach, and John Bowden and John Wilson were praying for. It was a deal of confidence in the camp, and it's being shown by the crew. It's a sight that Cambridge, and I'm surprised that Chris Bailey is not jumping up and down, haven't seen for a very long time. I'm tied down to my seat, otherwise I would be. This is amazing for Cambridge. It's also a remarkable achievement. It shows how very, very good these crews are, because the conditions today are good, but not exceptional, and yet we're seeing record-breaking time. Here they are coming up to Harrods Depository, a little bit short of a uh, mile and a half. And we are also seeing two Olympic champions in the middle of that Oxford boat, now two and a half to three lengths down on a Cambridge crew. Two Olympic champions who have not been in this kind of position before. Very, very difficult for them, and they are expected to be the ones to pull Oxford back into contention. They were expecting, they were expecting Cambridge to be fast away. They were expecting Cambridge to have trouble with their big chopper blades after about this, well, at this point, after about seven or eight minutes, and this is where they were expecting to start to pull them back. It does set show what we've been discussing all week, really, the tremendous credit to Cambridge for making a unit out of what is potentially weaker people. And I'll tell you what, Chris, all the criticism about staying up in Nottingham looks uh, a bit questionable now. They obviously got that right. And we're looking down now on Hammersmith Bridge. The uh, record time there is 6.24, set by uh, Oxford also in 1978, although that Oxford crew didn't have the uh, winning course time. Just look at the distance of the long... Surrey Bend, we're on the crown of that bend now where the advantage is greatest. I just wonder, you know, when we were considering with these great, great events, when you get two tremendously cruised together, close cruise together, we would have thought that Cambridge would have gone out like this. It really is the most remarkable performance from it. Now, key to this is the American, I think, Malcolm Baker, rowing at six. We're looking here at Mason, the Cambridge stroke. And the time at Hammersmith Bridge, 6.21. So that's three seconds inside the record. Oxford at 6.29. We are seeing a powerful performance here, as well as a rhythmical one by the Light Blues. And certainly the Cambridge crew have settled into this, this rhythm, the Putney to Mortlake rhythm that they're looking for, and they've really got it. Um, the crews, in fact, have almost swapped stations. Cambridge are actually slightly wider now than Oxford, and they are really powering away. I do believe the key to the Cambridge crew in many ways has been the American Malcolm Baker, who wrote six in the Olympic crew, who just sets the crew up so nicely. He just binds it together. But isn't Mason, Will Mason, rowing so well? Eight people were tried, tried for the straight season, the Cambridge crew. He was the one who won through, broke his arm early in the season, and here he is stroking this tremendous blue ball. A lot of courses talked about the stroke and he sets the rhythm, but people argue that the sixth man is the most important, that the bow man gives it balance. Everybody has a, a role to play there. The bow pair are keeping the boat alive in the bow. The feeling is that it's moving much faster up in the bows. In the middle of the boat, you've got the men, the big men, anchoring it. They're the, they're the, the, the engine room. And though, that's where Baker is. That's where Bernstein is. Those guys are the ones who are the massive men in the middle, powering it back. They've got to, to support the stroke man, who's a rhythm man. He's a man of sort of intelligence. And the man sitting just behind him at seven is the one who translates that rhythm from the stroke to these big men in the, in the about. And that is what Cambridge are doing. They are letting their boat run. We can see Oxford now. Oxford are losing their finishes. You can see a lot of water coming off the blades of the Oxford crew. It means the blades aren't buried. It means there's anxiety in the boat. It means that they're not actually holding the solid, the solid finishes that they need. They've gone two and a quarter miles. That's the start of Chiswick 8 that we can see on the right. The nickname of Sinclair Gore rowing at seven is Sinks, and that's exactly what Cambridge are in. And I, uh, Sinclair Gore is a great, great discovery for Cambridge this year. Came out of the college boat last year where I first saw him, and he's uh, really rowing an absolute blinder today. Uh, what do the expressions show on the faces of the Oxford crew? Kingsley Pool, Joe Michaels, Boris Mavra, Richard Manners, they need his experience, even more Bruce uh, Robertson and Matthew Pinson. Philip Schuller, Ian Gardner. Philip Schuller at seven there, brought in really uh, very late in the, in the day, two weeks ago, 
Um, he's, he was in the German national team in 1990, but he didn't do a lot of rowing between 1990 and when he came to Oxford. Now, tell me about the balance now. With If they up the rate, they still have to, to have a clean stroke to, to, to get the cover. So upping what the, they do? Upping the rate is no good at all unless you've got the power to go with it. You can only actually up the rate with power in the water. They are at, the full, they are at full stretch now. And the real problem with these eights is they work very close to maximum speed all the time. To make a significant change takes an enormous amount of energy. And to bridge this gap, look how smoothly and keenly Cambridge are working. They are well within in themselves, and they can easily respond to anything that uh, could be done by Oxford. The key here is the boat is running. The boat is running between the strokes. That's the key thing here. That's what Harry Marlow's been looking for, and he is setting a sweet rhythm. And the crew is a working as a unit. Oxford at the moment are working as eight individuals. Harry Marn coached two of the finest technical eights which won gold medals in the World Championships in 1982 and 83. And he's concentrated, concentrated on technique all the time. It's really paying dividends here. This is one of the finest technical crews I've seen for many years. It's unusual for a, a coach from completely outside the whole boat race uh, uh, business to come in and make an impression as, as, as extraordinarily uh, impressive as, as Harry Mann has done. He's come in, first year in, he's winning. It's, it's a very uncomplicated character, and the uh, times for Chiswick Steps, 10.12, the record is at 10.15. They're still inside the record set by Oxford, that was in the 1984 race, Oxford at 10.21. So not only for a victory, but after all the years of suffering, of having to put up with the dark blues, enjoying the moment, Dan Topolsky smiles at me because he was instru instrumental, of course, in creating that uh, dominance of the dark blue boats. Suddenly, it's all coming right for Cambridge. The, it's coming to the end of the Surrey Bend, but that's not a problem for them because they are controlling the race. It's that's absolutely material, and here, there is going to be anger in this crew. They're going to want the biggest possible margin they can get here. They have got to rub this in because this is going to be a glory that's got to carry them through, not just this year, but into next as well. And so they'll really want this victory. And now, with all the pressure taken off them, they can really perform to their best. Oxford are the ones who are looking laboured, actually. Oxford are the ones who are looking tired. Cambridge out there in front are just sweetly in time. As we see them coming towards us now, you can see how well the timing is in that Cambridge crew. But if I suggested to you that that's usually the case with the crew behind, would you give me an argument? Um, well, we've seen some close races. Uh, last year's race, the two were locked uh, well in battle. But um, yes, the reason the crew are falling behind is very often in a boat race that the, 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 uh, the, the crew loses the boat race rather than the crew winning the boat race. Oxford have not put it together right. Oxford haven't actually welded their six internationals. And that's... So, Martin uh, Haycock, and there's Harry Mann and John Wilson looking down on the success. Sean Bowden there on the left as we look. Go, oh, keep going, keep going, says John Wilson. That's a marvellous sight for them. Uh, John Wilson, of course, for uh, one year was a coach at Oxford and was considered to be a bit of a renegade when he went to the Light Blues. Of course, historically, that, that has happened quite frequently in the past. But yes, in, in modern years, it was considered unusual. But now, at last, they've made their reputation. Such happy faces from the Cambridge coaches and their supporters. After all, they've not had anything to smile about since 1986, which was the last Cambridge victory. And that's the only the, the one victory they've had since 1976, which is almost when I was rowing so long ago, is it? I'm used to sitting up in the bows of the Oxford launch, looking across at the Cambridge faces, who, uh, with that sort of increasing depression as, it, as, as, the, as the race unfolded. This time it's the other way around. And purely by chance, the, uh, the various boats, which uh, include a 1904 boat and a modern fiberglass boat, were in the right stations. All the uh, Cambridge on the Surrey side and the Oxford on the Middlesex side. And the site for the uh, followers of Oxford is not a good one. Matthew Prince oh, look at the agony for Richard Manners. There's load on these individuals. As the boat is not running well, it feels terribly heavy. They're, they're really suffering now. You can see the pain in their faces. And here they come towards Barnes Bridge. Some of the experts thought it would be tight here. It's anything but. Cambridge retaining their advantage. Dirk Banger driving them away. Dave Gillard, James Behrens, Richard Phelps, and John Bernstein, and Malcolm Baker and Sinclair Gore and Will Mason and the Cox, Martin Haycock from Abingdon School.
youngest on the water, the Cambridge Cox. Three minutes to go now. They've got three minutes. They want to try and extend that lead. They're going to start winding it up now. It's four lengths there, four and a bit lengths, and they're going to try and extend that for more. That's for, that's for sure. Oxford, not much they can do now. They can try and close that gap. They can only lock it together a little bit more effectively, but it's very difficult at this time now. The crews have been taking about the same number of strokes, 33, 34 strokes a minute. It'll be interesting to see now whether Cambridge can drive that up, whether they can actually extend their lead even further. But they're a little bit now under the record. Cambridge at 14.04, the record standing at 13.57. It asks a lot for them to pull out even more than they've shown so far. But just look at the amount of water between the two boats and look at the expressions and the bend as we look at this shot. You can see that Cambridge and Oxford have had some difficulties with the cohesion of their crew. Gardner works very well with Pinson, but there are definitely problems on the bow side. They don't move together as a unit so well, and they've certainly not rowed anywhere near as well as Cambridge, who've been very, very consistent today. There they are, still sweet and clean, hardly any splashing on those blades. They place them in and accelerate the boat. And there we uh, just getting a whiff up from the brewery, which is a very sweet smell if you're in the lead, as Cambridge are and have been almost since the word go. Cambridge have been underrating uh, Oxford. They've been about one stroke a minute uh, less than Oxford all the way over the course. Uh, they're now beginning to wind it up, so we probably will see them open up just a fraction more. But they're going to wind up from 34 strokes a minute up to 35, 36, and 37. They'll take it in for the last minute. And Oxford certainly aren't going down without a fight. They've, they've increased their rate of striking. You can see them trying to drive the boat faster. But Cambridge are responding, and Cambridge are very comfortably in front. I suppose that Sam Benham all the time has been uh, not quite telling the truth to her men, saying, come on, you're still in with a chance. And this chick demanded so much from her men last year, saying that we're catching this, we're catching that. She's had to do that, but from a position that she must have known for a long time is going to be one of defeat. Oxford are winding it up. Oxford are winding it up, but it's Cambridge who got this well in hand. And it's all credit to Oxford for the effort but the victory is going to go to the Life Blues as they come up. The flag goes down. Cambridge have stopped the rot. They have gained the victory. And look at the expression there, particularly from James Perrins and Dave Gillard. Back come Oxford, finishing with some style. Let's pay credit to them. It's been a wonderful run by Oxford. But on this particular Saturday in March, it's been Cambridge's day. We could see that from all the coaches. We could see it now from all the oarsmen. It really has been a very, very fluent row. And Matthew Pinson has known all the time that there was so much to do that not so much should be read into the fact that he and Bruce Robertson were Olympic gold medalists. Robertson was in an eight, but Matthew, of course, with Steve Redgrave, was in a pair. There is an enormous difference. There is, but this is the most remarkable victory for Cambridge. They've had to 